Welcome everyone. This is the first of two um, video PowerPoint presentations on the mass media and political communication. This one um, is going to take us through several of our um, main topics. Let me just run through them quickly. We'll talk about some main definitions about things like you know, what we mean by the news and so forth. And then mainly what we're going to focus on, and I'll explain this, is, is not everything about the media, not everything about the field of communications, but the news media, what we sometimes call political communication. And we'll talk about their, the standing of the news media with the public and where that is at the moment. We'll talk about the functions of the news media in our political system and the development of the American mass media, that, that is where they came from and how they developed over time. We will talk about how they operate and how they are uh, regulated by, um, by the government, which is not very extensive, and there are some key limitations that I want to go over with you. And then we will talk about the effects of the news media on our political system. First, let's talk a bit about their standing in, in the uh, minds of the public. And this is from a major study that was done by the Knight Foundation a few years ago. Um, you can see, as you, if you look at this, that um, the, now the, the orange bar reflects um, that they trust only some media but not others. The, a blue line would be they trust all media. And as you can see, almost nobody, if you look at U.S. adults, almost nobody, 1%, does 17% trust most media, but look at the differences. Democrats, 33% trust most media, independents, 13, and look at Republicans, only three. And as you'll see it, as we talk about this, there's a partisan division um, in terms of how much people trust the news media. And if you go to where, you know, the, the do not trust any, I mean, everyone has some media. That's where you see, like, two-thirds to three-quarters of the public has at least some news media outlets that they trust. Um, but um, there are some that don't trust any. And if you look at independents and Republicans, you see 25 to 21 percent don't trust uh, any news media. And that, that must be a very depressing <laughs> state of mind to be in. Um, Gallup, uh, in, this is in the Knight study. These are all quotations from the Knight study I just talked about. Gallup, the big polling organization, has documented that there has been an erosion of trust in the news media over time. Um, from 2003 to 2016, the percentage of Americans who said they have a great deal or fair amount of trust in the media dropped from 54% to 32%. And then it bounced up back to somewhere in between in 2017 and 41%. Um, t over two-thirds of U.S. adults say that their trust in the news media has decreased over the previous 10 years. Uh, Republicans, this is mainly Republicans, 94% of Republicans, 95% of conservatives, that's almost all of them, say that they have lost trust in the media. And this is, you know, if you start asking why this is, it's because this is what their elites are telling them. This is what they hear all the time. They hear from talk radio, they hear from Fox News, etc., that they can't trust uh, anyone except the people in the right-wing news bubble, and, and they believe it. And this is a real issue in our society because we have a lot of people who don't trust things such as um, the need to uh, have vaccines against dangerous communicable diseases, etc., which they, because they think that people are lying to them. Um, this is part of what we, one reflection of what we were talking about earlier as populism, a strong sense that institutions can't be trusted, that they're run by elites who are out to get you. And that is a common belief among Republicans and political conservatives, um, and it's, it's problematic. Um, now, there are people on the left who also say they've lost trust in the media, but um, you know, it's, it, there is, as it says, Democrats and liberals are about as likely to say their trust in the media has not changed as to say it has decreased. So it hasn't gone up, but uh, Democrats and, and self-identified liberals are much less likely to say they've lost confidence over the last 10 years in the media. But what you see is what we saw in the previous uh, a bar chart. Two-thirds of the public, approximately, 67%, trust some news sources but not others. And what we're getting at here is something that we sometimes call news silos. And you know what a silo is, which is a, a big tubular thing that you store grain in. And 
many people we say are in news silos. That is, they listen only to sources or trust only certain sources, but not others. And that has become a very common way to look at it. So there's you know, an increasing um, uh, par partisanship in news media where they, they find certain things they want to listen to and certain things they don't. So for example, this is another study. This is a very recent one from the Pew Research Center. They determined that uh, if you look at the, at the lines, you can see the, the sort of dark, I guess the darkest line is kind of a greenish blue. That's the Democrats. The red, I guess it's a bluish green. The, the red line is Republicans. <clears throat> and then the, the line in the middle is everyone. So you see the difference in terms of trusting of national news organizations over the last five or six years that are covered here from 2016 to 2021. You see Republicans dropping in trust from 70% to 35%. Now, this is during the time when Donald Trump was running around the country telling Republicans that they shouldn't trust the news media. And as you can see, it had serious impact. Democrats had dropped a bit, but not very much, five percentage points. Then they asked them, what about local news organizations? And, uh, you know, uh, with Democrats stayed the same over those five years. It was a bit of a drop with independents and Republicans not very great. Social media, interestingly, <laughs> trust for uh, Democrats remained just about the same in social media and dropped for um, Republicans. Again, remember all the Republicans, especially Trump, saying that the, um, the, the Twitter and Facebook have some sort of bias in them. Well, you know, um, the, these constant claims from politicians eventually um, take root in people's minds and they begin to believe that it's true whether it is or not. Let's talk a bit about some definitions here. What do we mean by mass media? Um, media is actually a plural word. The singular is medium. So any medium that allows communication from an organization or an individual to many people at the same time, that's called a mass medium and multiple uh, mediums are called media. Now there are traditional and non-traditional media. By traditional media we mean usually print media like books, magazines, newspapers, and so forth. And then uh, we also include in there electronic media like radio, commercial TV, cable and satellite TV, movies, the internet. But then we get to the sort of non-traditional media, the, the more online media, the new media, social media. Because a lot of news, a lot of people get their news from those very sources, from Twitter, from um, Facebook, and from Instagram. And a lot of these sources are extremely unreliable and, and really should not be relied upon for anything. There's, um, you know, concerted efforts to put out false stories on uh, social media. And it's very easy to do because there's absolutely no screening of anything that, that goes up there. Anyone can... Um, set up a social media site and put out whatever they want and there's no editor, there's nobody saying, wait a minute, is that really true? You can put out whatever you want and many people have done that, have put out intentionally false stories and have convinced people of them, including um, Donald Trump who has been spreading lies on social media ever since he had the opportunity to get on them, including, as we'll talk about later, the myth of the stolen election. And now what we see is what we call a hybridization in media where uh, the print media have electronic versions, where the print media use not only electronic vision, versions of their newspaper, let's say, the Washington Post and New York Times, but they use social media themselves. So that's sometimes called hybridization, where one of the traditional media uses electronic sources as well. We also see a lot of technological change that affects the coverage of politics. Um, major daily newspapers have been losing circulation for a long time, but the use of social media and television has greatly increased, in, at least for most people, it's their major source, those are their major sources. And now we see increasingly what are sometimes called citizen journalists, basically anyone with a cell phone who can document events and post it on social media, and so we see reality right in front of our eyes. Uh, this has really changed what, what it means to generate news, hasn't it? But what do we mean by news? Well. A simple, you know, sort of everyone knows it uh, definition would be it's just information about recent events, uh, things that have happened, developments. But in reality, it's, it's a little harder to define if you think about it. I mean, what is news? What makes a story news? An editor will say, well, this is news, and that's why I ran it. And you say, well, what does that mean? What do you mean it's news? 
is it, is news what whatever some editor says it is or is it whatever they think will sell newspapers or is it something that you know if you're a professional journalist you know what news is is it just consensus group consensus uh, and also what's the story you know they say this is the story well so that story has to be framed every news story that you read had to be essentially created interpreted and framed and framed by journalists didn't it and these are matters of judgment and of course the judgments are made by people now in the case of journalism they're trained and they have editors but citizen journalists and bloggers and people on twitter and facebook and instagram and all the other social media uh, they don't really have editors and so the only judgments involved are the judgments of the individuals who decide to put it up to, they decide it's true they decide it's news they decide it's newsworthy and there's no professional oversight and there's no other opinion um, on the one hand that may connect us directly to facts and to things that really happened uh, on the other hand it might lead to um, dissemination of falsehoods so let's talk a bit about the functions of the mass media this is a picture from a very famous movie called Citizen Kane um, which is the story apparently it is a fictionalized story of a man by the name of William Randolph Hearst, who was a famous newspaper publisher who had a lot of impact on politics right around the late 1800s and early 20th century. Um, famous movie made about him, Citizen Kane, tries to dramatize that. Um, but what are they supposed to be doing? I mean, what are, we, what are the functions of the mass media in a nation that claims to be a democracy? Well, one thing is we want them to inform the public. Um, we want them to keep us informed about what is going on in the circles of government, public policies, power, ideology, um, the self-interest of our policymakers, et cetera, so that we can participate knowledgeably in, in, our, um, in elections and in the other avenues for political participation. They also engage in what, is, what are called cues and framing, and I've used those terms before, if you recall. Um, a cues are um, signals. You know, sometimes by the way a story is is written, by certain words that are used, um, and also by the way it is framed or the way it is put together, the focus, the angle of the story, they often subtly tell us how to view events. And uh, events can be framed as good or bad or positive or negative. Uh, a politician can be framed in a, a positive light or negative light. And they, they do this very, with very often with very subtle um, cues, photographs, keywords that they use. They can also set the agenda for the public you know, because if the news media really focus on an issue, it forces our, often forces our policymakers to take some sort of position on it because they keep getting asked about it because the media is concerned about it. Um, Hillary Clinton's emails, for example, in the 2016 election would be a really good example of that. This is not something she wanted to talk about. But she kept getting asked about it. The New York Times ran literally hundreds of stories about this issue, which turned out to be nothing. Nothing of any substance ever came of the whole Hillary's email story. There was no impropriety that was ever really discovered. There was no criminal prosecution. There was no evidence of any security breaches that amounted to anything. But, but they forced her to talk about it, and they forced us to think about it throughout the election. And that's called agenda setting, where they tell us what we should be paying attention to. Um, another important thing is, is to act as sort of watchdogs on those in power, to take sometimes an adversarial posture regarding whoever is in office, um, to try to challenge them and make them defend what they do and, and, and sort of be fearless, so to speak, and to not be um, reflexively supportive of people just because they're president or governor or member of Congress, but to really challenge them for, for our benefit. That's the thing that they usually believe they should be doing, the media. Um, it's also a forum, it's a platform where there can be open debate about issues. Maybe not literally a debate, but where they air all sides of an issue. And if they do that, then it gives us a chance to think about all sides of an issue. And they can also represent us to people in authority. In other words, the voice of the people, the vox populi, um, where they go in there and say, wait a minute, we want to know what happened. Give us the facts. They use the Freedom of Information Act to acquire documents and this sort of thing. They're, they're, they're trying to help us find out what took place. Um, now, 
there is just an enormous amount of political knowledge out there. There is a tremendous amount of information about politics. And theoretically, we would hope that the more people know, the more they participate. And the less they know, the less they participate. Funny thing is, there's an enormous amount of information available to us, but yet what Americans really do know about politics is pretty low. And so is that, I just raised this as a question, is that the fault of the news media? Or is this maybe fault of the education system? But it is true that we have a lot of knowledge available to us, and many of us don't take advantage of it. So I mentioned this business about cues and framing. Um, keep in mind that cues and framing are done not just by the news media, but they are often the result of what we call spin, where people working for politicians or politicians themselves endeavor to spin or manipulate the media to frame issues a certain way. There's a, someone in politics, uh, each campaign usually has one, it's called a spin doctor. It's just kind of a joke, but it, it means that's the person whose job it, it is to try to manipulate the press coverage. And, and that is, they give, they suggest framing. They suggest to the news media, hey, cover our campaign this way, or cover our opponent this way. Um, and <laughs> presidents are, as we talked about, are in a very good position to um, use the presidency as what we call the bully pulpit, that's what Theodore Roosevelt called it, to go on TV and talk to all of us and reach into our private lives, talk to us in our living rooms. That's the thing that Congress and the courts really don't do very well, if at all. So all these things are um, really significant. You know, we have um, uh, framing, agenda setting, and, and ultimately these things impact um, public policy. Now, this gentleman here, this is a very famous um, writer. He's, uh, was a, he's a retired uh, linguistics professor from uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the most famous linguistics scholars in the world. And he's also a very famous writer on politics, and he has written a lot about distortion and manipulation in the news media. And he, he sees a lot of, he believes that a lot of what we see on television actually qualifies, and in the newspapers, qualifies as propaganda. Um, propaganda means meaning that people are basically trying to brainwash us to, to, to convince us of things that are not necessarily true. And he focuses on ownership. He says that we have to, when we want to understand where the bias is, we need to look at who owns the news media. Uh, it is owned by, they're owned by big business corporations. We'll talk about who, that, who those are in a, in a bit. But, um, and, and they sustain themselves through advertising. They, they must appeal to other corporations uh, who, who take out ads in on their pages or on their TV stations. And therefore, they have to appeal to those advertisers. They rely heavily on official sources, so they don't want to offend government officials because uh, many, in many cases, there are some uh, politicians uh, who they do want to offend, but in many cases, there are politicians that, and, and staffers and others they, they want to use as sources, so they don't want to burn those people too much. They also often use fear. And his argument is that in trying to attract viewers and readers, uh, the news media are tempted to use fear to, to scare us, to scare us about pandemics or war or um, the economy or something. Um, and you, know, you can read more about this if you want. I'm not asking you to get these books, but uh, Noam Chomsky, this person I'm talking about, and Edward Herman wrote a book on this called Manufacturing Consent the political economy of the mass media, when the basic contention is that the news media are used by the elites who run our society to manufacture our consent. Remember we talked about the consent of the governed? Well, they say that media are used, basically, to manipulate us and manufacture the consent that the government needs to function. So that is one view. Uh, it's not the only view, and you don't have to agree with it. That is their view. So let's talk a bit about where the news media came from, shall we? This is an old, this is an old, I love this uh, picture of this old newspaper, the last uh, issue of a newspaper, and they put this kind of skull and crossbones on it. This is way back in the 1700s. This is expiring in hopes of a resurrection to life again. Um, 
this is a goes back to the old old days when um, the news media were very different. Uh, the whole notion that there was such a thing as news that people everyone needed to know about originates somewhere between 1690 and 1850, um, in at least in our country and in Europe. Because before that, you know, really nobody felt the need to notify the public of developments in the world, in politics and weather and all this sort of thing. Um, the um, early newspapers, the, what we call the press, when you read in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of the press, they really literally meant newspapers, you know, the printing press. There were during the 1800s, there was a very close relationship, typically, between newspapers and political parties. And newspapers were actually sponsored by political parties in many cases. And over time, in the late 1800s and on uh, through the early 20th century, it became more and more of a business where they supported themselves through advertising. Um, and, and now we have today a whole set of doctrines that have emerged from a professional commercialized news industry where people get college degrees, they learn about how to do their trade, uh, they're proud of it, they are professionals, and they aspire to doing their job well and moving up their professional hierarchy. Um, they came up with this idea of objectivity. And object, we, we, you know, this is a thing we'll talk about more, but um, it's a posture that they try to take to try to avoid the consequences of their own bias. This is what professional journalists are supposed to do. And this is something that they began to find uh, difficult to do in, during the 50s and 60s when government scandals made it difficult for them to just cover things neutrally. They felt they had to go on the attack to, you know, on, on behalf of the public. And in the 1970s, things like the Watergate scandal and other government scandals forced them really into an adversarial role. And we began to see the emergence of uh, what's sometimes called investigative journalism, where they, they, they work really hard to get to do more than just hear the official version of the facts. They want to go into the details. Uh, later, we see an era of technological consolidation in the 1980s and 1990s, um, where and we'll, I'm going to show you this, where the uh, many, many news outlets came to be owned by a very small number of big businesses. We call that consolidation. And then, of course, as we all know, in the 1990s to the present, the rise of the news media social media, uh, infotainment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what we have now is an enormous amount of information, but sometimes we don't know what to believe. <clears throat> now, we're in the, uh, the, the modern news media really began, um, and I mentioned William Randolph Hearst, back in the late 1800s. And one of the key moments in that whole process of the news media becoming what they are today was the Spanish-American War where uh, publisher William Randolph, Re William Randolph Hearst wanted the United States to go to war with Spain. And he used his newspapers really to promote a war hysteria in the public. Have you ever heard of that happening before? No. Well, it's been done many times. And it was done in this country leading up to the invasion of uh, Iraq in 2003, where the news media uh, whipped the country into a frenzy over we weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that it turned out did not even exist. But if you go back and look at the news coverage from 2003, you will see that the news uh, was replete with um, scare tactics and uh, claims that came from government officials that Iraq was loaded with you know, WMDs and we had to invade to get rid of them. Well, we did invade and they didn't have them. And uh, something similar was, you know, this is, this is again almost an echo of the, of the Spanish-American War where a newspaper publisher, in this case one person, wanted us to go to war with Spain. And they, they promoted the myth that, apparently it's a myth. I mean, this has been investigated. There was a battleship called the Maine. It was in Havana Harbor, and it blew up. And Hearst's newspapers and others uh, made the argument that somehow the Spanish were responsible for this. And uh, it, it turned out, at least in, in retrospect, it was something of a mystery, but it's entirely possible that there was no bomb or anything involved, that, that it was just an exploding boiler. But, um, you know, it, it, this was the pretext for sending us off to war against Spain. Next comes radio. Um, the first commercial radio broadcast was August 31st, 1920. 
Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as president, used radio chats, they called them fireside chats, to great advantage during the Depression and World War II. Um, and radio is still very important. We'll talk more about the Fairness Doctrine, but basically um, AM, you know, there's AM and FM on radio. AM has a lot of talk radio on it. And um, in, starting in 1987, it became quite legal in this country to use the broadcast airwaves to, to uh, put out very, very ideological, one-sided uh, coverage of events. You know, before 1987, you weren't allowed to do that. You had to do a balanced treatment of news in order to have a, a broadcast license, but that's gone now. And so what we see is a very often very ideological right-wing radio everywhere. There's some, there are some left-wing uh, talk shows, but very few. For some reason, progressives have not been as successful in making use of radio as conservatives uh, have. But the world of podcasting, now as we all know, that is, has everything. Every conceivable perspective is available on on podcasting, and you can find every, any perspective that you want there. Uh, TV has become most people's main source of news. The first TV news broadcast was in 1940, and very quickly, I, I mean, I'd argue by the 1950s, it, it, it supplanted print and radio as the primary source. And we have not only uh, the broadcast TV, but we have cable TV and satellite TV. So, And this is why... Um, the Federal Communications Commission began to reduce its regulation of, of um, television because when there were only a few stations available in broadcast TV, then the justification was, well, we, we have to um, regulate this because there's a very small number of sources. But now there are literally hundreds and hundreds of, of TV channels if you add up broadcast, satellite, and cable. And so the justification for regulation is much is much less. We don't. You can always choose a different station. In other words, that's the theory. Now, online media. You are obviously very familiar with this. The key characteristics are: it's become a very important news source for many people, especially young people. And there's almost no editing of this. In many cases, there is no editing at all. There are no standards. There's all kinds of um, sources of information that look like journalism. That look as as much like journalism as a page from the Washington Post, but they're made up. And uh, it is, they're very easily manipulated. Some of this is, some of the podcasts and blogs and, and other things you see are journalism. Some are just one person with their own little vanity project, and some are completely made up by, by foreign governments or uh, people who want to brainwash you. So it's very difficult to know what to believe in the case of um, and when what to trust in the case of social media outlets. Um, TV is still the major source. I mean, I, I number one, more than anything else, is TV. About almost 60%, 57% of people say that their main source um, is a TV. But online is increasing rapidly and then following radio. And print, which used to be the main source, is now in last place. And, of course, it will probably not surprise you that uh, younger people uh, are much more likely to get their, uh, to say, their primary source is online, whereas uh, older people, it's television. And that, that is, it's a really sharp division, as you can see from looking at that. Uh, I want to take a moment to talk with you a little bit about Fox News because it's really a special thing. Um, Fox News is actually not a news station. It is, it is propaganda. It was... It was the project of a Republican uh, operative and a right-wing um, news broadcaster named Rupert Murdoch, who owns a newspaper empire, and he's an Australian um, media mogul. And um, a man named Roger Ailes, who was a follower of, of former President Richard Nixon. And, you know, for years, Roger Ailes had wanted to start something he was going to call GOP-TV. GOP means that's the Republican Party. They're called GOP. It means Grand Old Party. And he wanted to create GOP TV. He hated the news media. He believed the news media got rid of Nixon, even though Nixon was you know, clearly guilty of numerous crimes. He blamed, uh, Ailes blamed it all on the, on the news media. And so he wanted to start his own network. Um, and he finally got the opportunity. And he was going to call it GOP TV. In other words, it would have been flat out just partisan news. 
But Rupert Murdoch, and he decided to call it Fox News. And so there you have it, uh, Fox News, which is right-wing propaganda presented as if it were news. And now uh, I realize that sometimes Fox News does, you know, very good coverage of uh, breaking news events. I mean, they can, they have, uh, you know, some excellent reporters and they can go out and cover a hurricane or a war or something on the scene coverage. And they have some very, very good journalists who are doing, you know, factual reporting. But most of what you see on Fox News, the commentary from the, like these people who come on in the morning or Sean Hannity and uh, Tucker Carlson and these people, this is nothing more than right-wing propaganda. It isn't even remotely news. And they've been caught lying again and again and again. And in fact, surveys show, studies, actual studies show, that um, people who get their news from Fox are less informed about politics than people who don't watch the news at all. And I'll show you a graph from a study about this. They asked people a series of questions uh, about domestic politics and policy, and they found that the people who knew the most were the ones who were uh, listeners of, of national public radio. And then they asked them about other shows, and down CNN and MSNBC. And then you see that red bar, that is people who don't watch the news at all. And below that is Fox News. That is, the people who watch Fox News know less, they are less accurate in what they know about the world than the people who don't watch news at all. And that's how bad it is. Now, um, so, you know, you may have family or friends who think Fox News is reliable, and it's something to be very, very careful of because uh, you need to understand that they are coming from a 100% ideological perspective. Um, there is this thing called the right-wing news bubble, and that is... Um, a, a system by which people can surround themselves with consistent, repeated messaging on issues where they hear the same thing over and over on certain issues, immigration, crime, voting rights, uh, the myth of the stolen election, etc. And it consists of a number of people. Fox News is ground zero for this. There are some magazines like National Review, a very important newspaper, and this is the Washington Times, which is owned by the... Um, originally was founded by a church called the Unification Church uh, and Reverend Sun Myung Moon, um, a Korean um, religious leader. And New York Post, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, the Wall Street Journal, also owned by Murdoch, who owns Fox News, a bunch of websites and so forth, and then um, a number of local media stations and a whole lot of personal networks. This constitutes like a little bubble where the same message can be um, beamed into people's brains from many sources. Maybe one of the worst of all is Sinclair Broadcast Group, which is 193 stations all around the country, um, mostly in the South and Midwest. And they run, um, they, there's probably one of the most, if not the most, unreliable news sources in the entire country. Um, this gentleman, Boris Epstein, is a former Trump aide, and they put him on, you know, claiming that he's reciting the news, and he's and much of what he says is simply made up. So, um, and it is designed to um, to propagandize people. Uh, I'm gonna uh, much of this also, and I I'm sorry to be dwelling on this so much, but it's so important. And you'll see why in a minute when I give you some data on this. Much of what's in the right wing news bubble now, or at least in starting in 2016 and on until we don't know when, uh, is amplification of lies that originated from Donald Trump. Um, fact checkers in the Washington Post and elsewhere discovered that he made 16,000 plus false claims in his first three years in office. Uh, his practice has always been to intentionally repeat things that he knows to be false over and over and over, knowing that they will be repeated in the media, and that is what happens. And these are some examples. He said that Ukraine, not Russia, interfered in the 2016 election. That was a lie. He said that, that Biden had acted corruptly to benefit his son in, in Ukraine. That turned, there's no evidence of that. He claimed that a, a whistleblower who, who led to his original, his first impeachment over his uh, attempted extortion of the uh, president of Ukraine, uh, he said that the, what the whistleblower said was false, but it turned out to be true. He claimed that, he says, Article 2 of the Constitution gives, gave him, quote, the right to do whatever I want as president. Well, you've, we've gone over Article 2 of the Constitution. <laughs> Obviously, you know there's no such thing there. He claimed that tariffs that were being paid by the American people were actually taxes on China. 
you know, he imposed tariffs on Chinese goods. Well, who pays those tariffs? We do. When we buy, we pay the tariff when we buy a product that costs more because it's a tariff on it. He claimed that he was taxing China. He said it over and over. He knows it's not true, but he said it again and again. He said that the Robert Mueller report that was related to his first impeachment um, exonerated him, totally exonerated him, completely false. It, it indicated that he was probably guilty of obstruction of justice. Um, and he at one point claimed that a hurricane was going to hit Alabama, uh, d despite all the evidence. And so when he was given a weather map that disproved it, he drew on it with a Sharpie to make it look like the, the, the hurricane was going to hit Alabama and went on television with it. He has said that windmills, you know, wind, uh, 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 the windmills that generate electrical power cause cancer, he just made it up. That we have to flush our toilets 10 or 15 times now because of regulations on the water use of toilets, that we would be going to Mars very soon, that his wall was being built very quickly, and about coronavirus and on and on. You've, you, you may remember some of these things. He said that uh, at once, right, at, right after it start, the epidemic started, the pandemic started, he said it would be going down to zero very soon. Well, you know, that was nonsense. He said, he said it was a hoax, that nobody knew there would be a pandemic. Uh, or epidemic of this proportion and denied having fired the experts whose job was to foresee exactly what happened? Well, he did that. He fired, he or his uh, uh, national security advisor, John Bolton, fired the pandemic officials and disbanded their office uh, that Obama put in place um, to, to guard against exactly what happened with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, they, were, they were initially concerned about Ebola, and after the Ebola epidemic that occurred during Obama's administration, they created an office to protect us against pandemics, and uh, Trump's appointee, Bolton, got rid of it and uh, fired them all, and then Trump said, that's not true. Well, it is true. That is exactly what happened, and on and on. Um, so, um, you know, there are many, many things that he said that turned out to be, not be true, but one of the worst for political consequences is this one right here. Um, and I want to spend just a moment on this because it's very consequential. This is the last slide in this show, but I want to spend uh, this, this part, but I just want to discuss this with you. Um, after he lost the election, which he lost decisively and very clearly in uh, 2020, he began immediately to lie about it and to say that actually he won. And he had a whole array of lies about it. And so this is a study that just basically tracks some of the things he said. Some of them had to do with vote counting. He claimed that votes had been counted, that votes were, that ballots were brought in in suitcases and fake ballots, and there was ballot box stuffing. He lied about poll watchers. He lied about voting machines. That He, he claimed that voting machines were programmed by uh, uh, other countries to do certain things. He claimed that dead people voted. He made all sorts of stuff up about signatures. He claimed that in many jurisdictions that he lost, there were more votes than there were people. And these are all things that he made up. And there were over 60 lawsuits that his legal team filed, and they lost every single one of them because they were unable to produce any evidence to support any of these claims. So everything that they said about the election being stolen was false. It is the most scrutinized election in American history. And um, Republican and Democratic officials alike verified the results over and over and over in every single state in the country. But he will never stop, uh, refused to stop uh, saying that it was stolen from him. And so now you look over here and you will see the consequence of all those lies. And you know, by the way, the lies got him kicked off social media because they realized that he was you know, uh, causing all sorts of problems, including an insurrection. Well, um, let's look at the, at the effect of these um, lies over time. If you, uh, here's, the, here's the question that was asked. The percent who agreed, do you, do you believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump? Let's take all Americans. 16% of Americans believe that completely. 15% mostly agree. So that's 31% of the public that basically agrees that the election was stolen, and we know that's completely false. So that's 31% of the public that believes something that we know to be completely false. And then we go over to uh, mostly disagree and completely disagree, and that is 67%. But isn't it kind of disturbing that we have almost a third of the public? But let's see who they are and what they read, okay? Republicans, 40%, 40% of Republicans completely agree with that claim. 
28% mostly agree. So there's 68% of Republicans thinking that we have a stolen election. Uh, where do they get their news from? Uh, let's see. Let's look at uh, trust in news. People who trust mainstream news, you know, it's a much smaller percentage, isn't it, that believe this. But look at who trusts Fox News. If you look at who's trust, who trusts Fox News, you see 47% completely agree that the election was stolen. And another 35% for a shocking 82% think the election was stolen. And then there are the far right-wing sources like Sinclair News and Breitbart and others. And there you can see it's almost all of them. It's 97% of them believe that the election was stolen. Now, uh, and then contrast that with the independents and the Democrats. So the point being that it makes a great deal of difference where you get your news from because that news can create a sense of reality in you. And you can end up believing things that are either true or completely false. So we always have to be very careful what we use for news sources. And uh, when we go to the next video, which I'll, uh, I hope you'll also listen to this week, you'll see that we'll talk about how the news industry is organized, how the news media organized into conglomerates, and uh, a bit more about their political impact on our uh, system and our elections and on our beliefs about government.